open our hearts to receive uh, you and to receive more of you. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Continue with the greatest sermon of all time, <laughs> behind uh, the sermon on the mount. <clears throat> and just want to kind of remind us of what we learned a couple classes ago, because uh, this builds on it, but we spoke about how the Lord speaks to us, and how uh, St. Bernard opens up before us the different ways that God speaks to us. So you remember... Uh, from Sermon 32, and I'll just go through this really quick, um, that as we ponder the Word of God, that the, the Lord, He guides our thoughts and our meditations on the Word of God after we read it and take it in. That, too, is part of God speaking to us. So St. Bernard says, For our meditations on the Word, who is the Bridegroom, on His glory, His elegance, power, and majesty, become, in a sense, His way of speaking to us. When we meditate on his law day and night, let us be assured that the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message of happiness to us, lest our trials should prove more than we can bear. When you find yourself caught up in this kind of thinking, beware of seeing the thoughts as your own. You must rather acknowledge that he is present, who said to the prophet, it is I announcing righteousness. God accordingly utters words of peace, of goodness, of righteousness within us. We do not think these things of ourselves. We hear them in our interior. So yeah, it's a strong language. These thoughts that follow after we ponder the scriptures and that the Holy Spirit is guiding, uh, that's the Lord speaking to you, showing you how this scripture, this passage of scripture applies to you and how he wants you to receive it here and now. And he says, beware of seeing it as your own thoughts. Beware, you you know, practical Christian deist out there uh, who tend into Christian deism and think God no longer speaks or acts on a practical level. Uh, beware, don't fall into that error. Beware of thinking those thoughts are your own. It's the Lord guiding your meditation, him speaking to you. And then in 45, we heard that Well, 67 speaks about the affections have their own language. The affectus has its own language, St. Bernard says. Our desires are another way that we speak to the Lord. They speak by silences. Uh, our desires for the Lord are our crying out to him. And the desires he implants in us are him speaking to us. So then in Sermon 45, we hear more about this. We hear that the speech of the word is an infusion of grace and loving kindness. And the speech of the soul is its response, wonderment, gratitude, the fervor of devotion. So he says, the word is a spirit, the soul is a spirit. And they possess their own mode of speech and mode of presence in accord with their nature. The speech of the word is loving kindness. That of the soul, the fervor of devotion. When the word therefore tells the soul you are beautiful, and calls it friend. He infuses into it the power to love, and to know it is loved. And when the soul addresses him as beloved and praises his beauty, she is filled with admiration for his goodness. The speech of the word is an infusion of grace. The soul's response is wonder and thanksgiving. The more she feels her past and her loving, the more she gives in love, and her wonder grows when he still exceeds her. And that's what St. John of the Cross says, Living Flame uh, 1-7, that God's speech is God's effect in the soul. The effect that God produces in our soul is one way he speaks to us. God's speech is the effect he produces in our soul. His action in our soul is his speech to us, living flame of love, uh, one seven. And so we see the same thing here in St. Bernard. The speech of the word is an infusion of grace. And our, the soul's response is wonderment, it's thanksgiving, uh, is its speech back to the Lord. 
So we want to uh, receive these things in faith. To receive the Lord's presence and his acting and speaking to us uh, today in these different ways. To receive it in faith. Because it won't be clear and manifest. You can always see his natural causes of it. But, uh, you know, pull your, pull out of that deism and recognize the presence of the Lord and Him speaking and acting. So we'll hear more about this here in uh, Sermon 57. So, uh, 57, number three, he says, um, Who among us do you think is so vigilant, so attentive to the time of his visitation and the bridegroom's coming, that he every moment scans every detail of his approach? So that when he comes and knocks, he opens the door to him right away. These words are not so applied to the church as to exclude any one of us, who together are the church, from a share in its blessings. For in this respect, we are all universally and without distinction called to possess the blessings as our, her- as our heritage. Hence the psalmist dared to say to the Lord, your testimonies are my eternal heritage. They are the joy of my heart. A heritage, I think, by which he saw himself as a son of the Father. He saw himself as a son of the Father who is in heaven. For if a son, then an heir, an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. And he boasts that in this heritage he has acquired a great boon, the testimonies of the Lord. All right, so we hear that sometimes, right? Lay claim to the promises in Scripture. You know, God makes promises throughout the scriptures. And as we read uh, the scriptures, we should lay claim to those promises. They apply to us. This is what St. Bernard is, is talking about. These things apply to us in the scriptures. We, we have a share in, in these blessings and the heritage set before our eyes. Think of the heritage set before our eyes in Ephesians chapter 1. That canticle that we pray Monday nights. At Vespers. You know, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place is given to us in Christ. That's our heritage. And so to lay claim to these promises of the Lord. In times where those words come with greater conviction are, are visits of the Lord. And he highlights here um, our adoption as sons and daughters. When you receive uh, these blessings of the Lord, these promises of the Lord, you see that they apply to you, you're convicted of it. You stand in your sonship in Christ. You stand as an adopted child of God. Uh, That's because of a visit of the Lord. He saw himself as a son of the Father who is in heaven. For if a son, then an heir, an heir of God, and a fellow heir with Christ. You know, we can think of Ephesians 1, 17 and the verses that follow. Like, what is the hope of his calling? What are the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints? You know, the Lord wants us to taste these things now through faith and hope. And through the theological virtues of faith and hope, as you know, we we come into real contact with these mysteries that the Lord has won for us. A real touching of these mysteries. And so a real tasting of them. And we can't get there on our own power, even our, our own power with the ordinary workings of grace, we need the Lord's visitations to bring us more into the reality beyond just our pondering uh, about the reality. And the Lord does that in prayer through our Lexio Divina, through spending time with the scriptures, through soaking in uh, the words of scripture and more and more abiding, not so much with the words as with the word himself, the second person of the Trinity. But the words are there. Uh, we need the words that bring us to the word. Your testimonies are my eternal heritage. They are the joy of my heart. A heritage, I think, by which he saw himself as a son of the Father, who is in heaven. For if a son, then an heir, an heir of God, and a fellow heir with Christ. And he boasts, you know, that's confidence. He boasts that in this heritage he has acquired a great boon, the testimonies of the Lord. Would that I deserve to possess even one testimony of the Lord about myself. Because the psalmist is glorying not in one, but in many testimonies. All right, if just one of these blessings applied to me, what a blessing, how great that would be. Uh, but multiple testimonies about what the Lord has for us, about our heritage. 
He even says somewhere, I delight in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. And indeed, what are the riches of salvation? What are the delights of the heart? What is the true and safe security of the mind except the the attestations of the Lord? What he says about us, who he says we are, our identity in Christ. Why do we continue to defraud ourselves of these divine commendations or testimonies and deprive ourselves of our paternal heritage? Why fail to recall that he has in any way commended us or that he has uttered any testimony in our favor, as if he had not voluntarily made us his children by the word of truth. What what of what the apostle said, that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are (coughs) something. So Bernard is touching on a theme that, thankfully in our day, is kind of coming back in a strong way. You know, lay claim to who you are in Christ. Christian morality, it's about acting out of an identity given to us uh, through baptism, through the grace of God. Not so much what we kind of do by our own strength, but what God has made us in Christ. And then Christian morality is, is the outflowing of that. We receive this gift of being a son or daughter in Christ. And once you're convinced of that gift, you, you live from that. You live out in gratitude from that gift given you. And so St. Bernard is speaking about the same thing. And there are kind of two levels to this. I mean, there is, and this is good, that can be more of like um, a psychological level to it, which is still good, like Christian psychology, like, uh, yeah, let's make an effort to remember that I'm a child of God. Uh, Let's, you know, do what I can so I think of myself in this way. So that's one level. Um, And it's necessary and it's good. But then the the level that Bernard is speaking here is that, yeah, there are times where the Lord um, takes you into that reality and you taste it more. Not just your own efforts in convincing yourself of that, but that the spirit of adoption coming upon you in a more profound way. Spirit of adoption visitating you. And you're confident. You're in that parasia, that confidence of of a child of God. And you couldn't have gotten yourself there on your own. You know, you help you help get yourself there through what you know the efforts we make in this regard, calling in mind the the words of Scripture, claiming these promises for our own. But there are times where the Lord kind of takes us to a place we couldn't have gotten to on our own. And this is what Saint Bernard is highlighting for us. It's a visitation of the Lord. One of my um, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to share stories about myself, but I don't, um, I'm not good at telling stories. I feel like I need to kind of um, add variety to my teaching. So I'm kind of stuck with it. Um, and you're stuck with it. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the ways that I discern coming back to the Dominicans from the Carthusians, kind of one of the elements of it, you know, there were a number of elements, but um, this one is most uh, applicable here. But, um, yeah, there would be times where I would come back from a night office. Um, you know, so it would be like 2 or 3 in the morning. And I would, I would always come back, and then I would stick my head outside, outside my window and just take in, take in the stars in the big open sky. You don't get to see the stars so much here in the city, but in the middle of Vermont, uh, it's pretty amazing. And then so I would just spend some time uh, taking, in that, taking that in. And then I'd go into cell, and then we would pray lots of Our Lady. The little office of Our Lady, you would pri- you'd pray privately in your cell before you go back to bed. Um, but yeah, but sometimes prayer would be going well, so I would, I would just stick there and uh, just, just keep praying some more. Um, and so yeah, those moments where... Um, so yeah, and there'd be moments where it's like... Um, I was, you know, standing before the Lord as his son. You know, we have the baptism of the Lord where the heavens open and the father uh, speaks to the son, his identity. This is my beloved son. We see it again in the transfiguration. And those are graces, the mysteries of Christ that are meant for us to to walk in, to stand in ourselves. Christ opens up that way uh, so that we step into that place 
and the Father speaks that word to us, my beloved son, my beloved daughter. The heavens are opened in a way. So these are moments of grace. You know, they're stronger at some times than others. And they're visits from the Lord. And we're, we're meant to have them. And so, you know, just to use the same language, so yeah, there are times during those nights where, um, you know, it was as if, you know, the heavens were opened in the sense of a stronger sense of God's presence. That is something I couldn't have brought about. And um, a sense of the Father claiming me as, as son. And when I would stand there, I would just, I would tend to go to the priestly Oron's position uh, and receive that, that word from the Father. Stand under his loving gaze, uh, which we'll hear about more. Sermon 57, under the loving gaze of the Father, standing there confident in your sonship, confident uh, as a daughter of God, confident of his love. And then the Lord revealing to me in a way at those times, like having a sense that, you know what, I'm, I'm called to be a, a Dominican, to hand on the, the what I've contemplated. Um, so that was part of my discernment back to, to the Dominicans, was kind of those key times where you do feel yourself under the loving gaze of the Father, the heavens have opened, you're getting a share in that mystery of the baptism of Christ, the transfiguration. And yet what the Lord shows you there uh, is important. And it could be something that you, you catch a glimpse of, uh, and then you just have to kind of seize it by faith, and other times it won't be so clear. Um, but you, you have that, and you can hold on to that, and that can show you the way forward. That can direct your steps forward. So discernment doesn't always look like that, um, but I think there, I mean, there are, yeah, I think it, it's usually an element of it in one way or another. And so, yeah, so to, to pay attention to those times where you are most kind of secure and confident in your identity in Christ and the, the, the loving gaze of the Father upon you, and seeing there in your heart, yeah, who am I? Like, what is it, uh, who, who I am, like, what's all entailed in that? Where does your heart go? And that can be a way to discern things. That can be the Lord showing you. Um, you're called to be a sister of life. Showing you that, you know, within the pathway of the sister of life, this is what your, your, your life is to look like more. This is, this is to be like your call or your specialty, your call within the call. Or um, this is how you are, you are to reach out to, to uh, the women that you're serving. Uh, so we want to pay attention to the, these visitations from the Lord. And uh, be open to like what the Lord tells you about yourself and, that, and your mission. Because right? those can be key times where we, we receive our mission from the Lord. And other times it's like you're walking through the dark. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are there to guide me with your crook and your staff. With these, you give me comfort. Right? The crook and the staff, right? That's the, the hand of correction, of trials. But there you give me comfort, consolations, the two hands of, of the Lord, the crook and the staff. Uh, the consolation, you prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. He's true to his name, so he does all these things. He's our shepherd guiding us forward. And so, uh, yeah, we all have these times of transfiguration, of baptism, a share in the, the first and fourth luminous mysteries. And there, those can be times where the Lord opens up before us our mission, rooted in who we are in Him. Not just who we are in a general sense, a child of God, although that's you know, beautiful, but also in a very personal way. What your name is going to be in heaven. Right, it must have been one of these moments where St. Elizabeth of the Trinity receives that name, praise the glory. And it's scripture, right? It's scripture, this is the mysticism of the word. It's, it's a simple phrase of scripture, praise of glory. She read it, you know, a hundred times. Um, but at some point in her life, the Lord whoo, speaks that word in a powerful way. An anointed word into our heart. And it's a word that takes root. She receives. You know, she creates the silence to be able to receive these things from the Lord. She opens up that space of silence for the Lord to speak in this personal way. And he does. And that, that word takes root in her heart. And it creates. You know, the word of God is creative. It creates what it speaks. She becomes more and more that praise of glory and lives out of that identity. Her mission is shaped by that. 
You know, that's from the visitation of the Lord. That's from one of these shares in the grace of um, the first and fourth luminous mystery, the baptism of the Lord, the transfiguration of the Lord. But we all have our, our new name from the Lord, that name that will be written on that uh, bright stone, Revelation chapter 2, given that hidden manna to eat, and the name that no one knows but the Lord. And, you know, praise of glory for St. Elizabeth, like that's only part of her name, that's part of the mystery. You know, a little later in life, she tells the Lord that it's host of praise that the Lord is speaking of her, her host of praise. You know, that's another aspect on the mystery. These things are just kind of approaching the mystery. You as sisters of life, will you take on a mystery of Christ's life? That too, you, you seek in prayer. And the Lord draws you what aspect of, of Christ's life or what mystery of, of grace in the Lord's covenant he's calling you to have a special share in. Right? That's part of your new name. That's part of your, your new name um, that the Lord speaks to you. Not like it's, it becomes a longer and longer name, but these are all aspects on that thing you can't quite put a word to. Uh, your identity in God. Uh, who you are for all eternity. So John Mary, what's your uh, mystery? What's, do you have a feast? A, a feast day or a title? Yeah, yeah. The title is of the crucified Christ, but my feast day is John Paul II. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, both those things, both those things um, are say something about Sister John Mary's identity of the crucified Christ. Of the crucified Christ? Yeah, yeah. And John Paul II, uh, they, they, they capture something about her. Um, just, you know, a little bit, a little bit. And it's part of this, this new name that the Lord has, has spoken uh, to her heart. And she gets to discover more and more of it uh, as her her days unfold. She gets to discover more and more of it. Um, and so, yeah, we, we leave time for, for silence to allow the Lord to speak to us in these ways. Right? So that's what the St. Bernard is speaking about here. Um, and that's what it looks like as it plays out in our lives. My sister, my bride, you know, when those words like just knock you up to the floor. It's the word of God living and active spoken to us anew. And we don't want to miss it. We don't want to just say, okay, that was a good pious meditation where this kind of mystery really opened up before me. Um, you, know, you can mistake it. You can just see it as that. And, you know, that's pretty spiritual in itself. But no, to see it, this is relational. It's the Lord speaking that word to me directly. And it's within that context of the relationship with the Father, under the loving gaze of the Father. Uh, those words coming to us are words of love. And so he continues. You know, why do we fail to recall that he has, we fail to recall that he has in any way commended us or that he has uttered any testimony in our favor as if he had not voluntarily made us his children by the word of truth? What of what the apostle said that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God? Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's right. Um, that's a good way to put what I'm trying to, to say here. Yeah, it's the Spirit bearing witness within us about who we are. And the same bears witness that, the same Spirit that bears witness to us, like to ourselves, so we know it, also bears witness through us as we live out that identity and that mission among the people we serve, and as we show that to the world through our lives. That same Spirit uh, bears witness makes Christ known through us. Yes, we speak words about Christ, but the Spirit comes and bears witness in a way uh, beyond that, uh, building on that, enhancing that, uh, bringing that forward with power and conviction. Yeah, we're voluntarily made his children by the word of truth. What of what the apostle said, that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are sons of God. How are we sons if deprived of the inheritance? Our very impoverishment surely convicts us of our negligence and indifference. For if any one of us, following the wise man's word, sets his heart fully and perfectly to rise early to seek the Lord who made him and pleads in the presence of the Most High, 
if he strives at the same time with all diligence, following the prophet Isaiah's advice, to prepare the ways of the Lord, to make straight the paths of our God, if he can say with the psalmist, my eyes are ever on the Lord, and I keep the Lord always before me, shall that person not receive a blessing from the Lord and mercy from God his Savior? He will be visited often. (laughs) He will be visited often and never be unaware of the time of the visit. Even though he who visits in spirit comes secretly and stealthily like a shy lover. Right? So it comes with power, comes with conviction, but it's, it's not yet the beatific vision. Uh, there's something very subtle about this. This lines up with Spiritual Canticle 1, that early part. Uh, where have you hidden, beloved? He's hidden in the depths of our soul. You have to, you have to hide yourself to find that hidden treasure. John the Cross says. And here St. Bernard says, he comes secretly, right, by faith. We only apprehend it by faith and hope, charity. He visits in spirit, he who visits in spirit comes secretly and stealthily like a shy lover. The sober-minded soul who keeps careful watch will see him coming a long way off and will discover everything that we have shown the bride taking note of so cleverly and so clearly in the approach of her beloved. For he said, those who seek me eagerly shall find me. She will perceive the desire of the hastening lover and will immediately be aware when he is near. And when actually present, she will detect with happy eyes the eye that gazes on her. She will detect with happy eyes the eye that gazes on her like a sun ray, piercing through the windows and lattices of the wall. And at last she will hear the voices of jubilation and in love will call out, my love, my dove, my beautiful one. St. Bernard says in 28.9, learn to receive with greater confidence, to follow with greater security whatever faith commends to you. So we want to receive these things from the Lord with ever greater confidence to follow it with ever greater security, uh, whatever faith commends to us. These things. And yeah, it's part of the, the Lord gazing upon us. Just if you want to write these things down, other passages that highlight the confidence uh, that these visitations bring and that help make up these visitations. Uh, 8, 9 is a good place. Uh, 2, 6 as well. Uh, I have some more written down somewhere. I think I'm Sermon 74. Anyways, I can give those to you later as well. Okay. Okay, any uh, questions or comments here at this point? Just wondering, what section was it when you were talking about um, she will detect with happy eyes the eye that gazes on her? Yeah, so that's the end of uh, 57 uh, 4. <laughs> Yeah, and how do we walk in this confidence as children of God? Uh, but by being under the loving gaze of the Father and abiding under the gaze of the Lord. Fifty-seven eight through 10 is a lot about the gaze of the Lord. We got to, we'll get to that here. Oh man, there's just so much. <laughs> um... Right, so I'll, so I'll just jump ahead to 57.8. So the fire has consumed every stain of sin, the rust of evil habits, uh, the soul, the conscience, the soul has been cleansed and made peaceful. And there follows an immediate and unaccustomed expansion of the mind, an infusion of light that illuminates the intellect to understand scripture and comprehend the mysteries. Right, you know, the word reading forth love coming as an intellectual illumination that breaks forth into the affection of charity. And what St. Thomas describes in his words. Same thing being described here. An unaccustomed expansion of the mind. Same thing we hear uh, from St. Teresa of Avila about infused contemplation. The prayer of quiet is an expansion of the soul. Um, 
Psalm 119, um, her Latin version, dilate, you, you have um, something like, like I run in the ways of your freedom. Now that verse from Psalm 119. And it's um, the Latin is, you have dilated my heart and I run in the ways of freedom. And so St. Teresa says, yeah, this is talking about infused contemplation. You have dilated my soul, you've expanded my soul, and I run in the ways of freedom. Same thing. Um, so the, the soul being cleansed and tranquilized, made peaceful, there follows an immediate and unaccustomed expansion of the mind, an infusion of light that illuminates the intellect to understand scripture and comprehend the mysteries, right? to come into a more profound contact with the mysteries. The first given for our own satisfaction, the second for the instruction of our neighbors. All this undoubtedly means that his eye beholds you, nurturing your uprightness as a light and your integrity as the new day, as Isaiah says. Your light shall break forth as the dawn. But as long as this mere crumbling wall of the body stands, this ray of intense brightness will pour itself in, not through open doors, but through chinks and crevices. All right, so not clear vision yet, but only through faith, through the veil of faith. You are wrong if you hope otherwise, no matter how great your purity of heart, because the greatest of contemplatives, Paul said, now we see only in a riddle and in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. After this glance, so full of graciousness and kindness, comes the soothing voice that gently insinuates God's will. It is no other than love itself, which cannot be idle, but invites and urges us along the ways of God. The bride, too, hears the call to arise and make haste, surely for the welfare of souls. All right, so that's what I've just been describing. You know, you're under the gaze of the Father. There's that, that glance. But with the glance, the gaze of love, comes that soothing voice that gently insinuates God's will, gently reveals God's will to you. You, know, you are praise of glory. You are a sister, you are a bride. Your call is you know, to be a sister of life. And so he insinuates his will, he makes known his will under this loving gaze with this soothing voice uh, through the inclinations of our hearts that we feel uh, and experience at those times. And as long as the body stands, this ray of intense brightness will pour itself in, not through open doors, but through chinks and crevices. So St. Gregory the Great, I think that's, I mean, that's in him. I think Bernard is probably taking it from him and through kind of the monastic tradition that was influenced by Gregory the Great. But Gregory the Great has this beautiful reflection on, yeah, contemplation, it's an, it's a, an, unenco an unencompassed light, but only through the chink of contemplation. So it's this light without bounds, this unencompassed light, but it enters the soul only through the cheek, through a crevice of, of contemplation. He imagines the, the windows of the temple being slayed windows, like at an angle. They only let in a little light, but that little light fills, fills the whole room. So that's the, the chink of contemplation, the crevice of, of, of contemplation, through the lattices, another way to kind of talk about it. And from being under the loving gaze of the Father, from receiving this conviction of who we are, even in our individual, you know, particular circumstances and mission and call, from standing under the loving gaze of the Father, we're sent out on mission. So he, he continues. It is characteristic of true and pure contemplation that when the mind is ardently aglow with God's love, it is sometimes so filled with zeal and the desire to gather to God those who, who will love him with equal abandon that it gladly forgoes contemplative leisure for the endeavor of preaching. Right, I'd rather be in the chapel, but here I am. <laughs> here I am teaching, preaching, um, wanting, uh, hoping to, to draw you, uh, hoping to, to, to push you into uh, this glow of God's love uh, beyond what I have to push you there. Um, 
So when the mind is ardently aglow with God's love, it is sometimes so filled with zeal and the desire to gather to God those who will love him with equal abandon that it gladly forgoes contemplative leisure for the endeavor of preaching. And then with this desire at least partially satisfied, it returns to its leisure of contemplation with an eagerness proportionate to its successful interruption until refreshed again with the food of contemplation, it hastens to add to its conquest with renewed strength and experienced zeal. So this is important in St. Bernard, and we'll have a whole class on um, the blending together of the contemplative life and the active life, prayer and our mission. It's key for St. Bernard. He has some very uh, profound things to say about it. So we will we'll talk about that a little more later in a future class. <clears throat> Okay, so I, okay, we have about five more minutes. I'm trying to think. Any, anybody want to say anything? Here, should I press on? Okay. Well, that class, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back yeah. <laughs> Day 11, contemplation and fruitful action. <laughs> So for St. Bernard, um, the soul is not only bride, the soul is also mother. <clears throat> bride and mother. So I jumped ahead there. And basically from there, then he talks, someone raised, you know, someone mentioned before, preaching, prayer, and contemplation. <sighs> okay, oh, yeah, I better just do this now. Um, and I think I've talked about this before. Prayer, preaching, prayer, and contemplation. Um, so those are aspects of our, our, our spiritual life that need to be there. Um, and so he lines up, you know, that household of Bethany. You know, we're, we're familiar with the Mary-Martha mm-hmm. comparison. Mary, uh, a symbol of contemplative repose. Uh, Martha, a symbol of active service. And, um, you know, the call for us to be both Mary and Martha. For Teresa of Avila, uh, spiritual marriage, the seventh mansion, that's, that's a model that she uses. It's not the model of, you know, the nun slave in the spirit in her corner of the cell all day uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in ecstatic trance. Uh, the model is Mary and Martha combined. Spiritual marriage, uh, going about our, our duties, uh, saving souls in a spirit of recollection and prayer. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, she, she hears the Lord Jesus say, say she wants, uh, he wants uh, victims of his love, both Mary and Martha combined, contemplatives in the world. So we, we know about that, Mary and Martha, be both Mary and Martha. Well, then um, St. Bernard says, also be like Lazarus. Don't be just like the two sisters, be like the whole household, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So he sees Martha as preaching, active service, Mary as contemplative repose. And what, what's Lazarus? Lazarus is a sign, is the, the pleading desire, the praying, asking for things. You know, Lord, I need more of you. Now, Lord, fill my soul. So he imagines uh, Lazarus groaning beneath the stone, beseeching the grace of resurrection. All right, so he's in that tough place, crying out to the Lord to be rescued to walk in freedom. So that needs to be an element of our spiritual lives as well. Crying out to the Lord, pleading, not just reposing in his presence like Mary, although that's another key part, you know, we need all three. Not just reposing in his presence, but also pleading with him, seeking things, asking, knocking, seeking. And our desire grows as we do that and it opens to receive more of him as we do that. And, you know, who knows, Lazarus, after he was dead, his, his soul is still exists, so maybe his soul really was, you know, pleading and uh, for this grace of being raised from the dead. But uh, whatever the case, you know, it's a good model, a good image that Bernard uses of Lazarus, what he stands for, this groaning, this, this, this moaning, this crying out uh, for more. Lazarus, the mourning dove, the one who mourns, sighing with supplication. And so, yeah, not to forget that aspect of our our prayer life. Just not contemplative repose, but also this this ardent seeking and begging.
And that's how we will, our souls will be that household that will be pleasing to the Lord at all times and pleasing to him in the, in the, the most profound way is when uh, all three are active, are at work in our souls, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then that's the way the Lord can really have his way with us. So we'll, we'll stop here. And yeah, we'll pick up with this again uh, next next time. Um, so we'll continue with 57 next time, talk a little bit about 74, and then go on. It'll be a nice transition into the wounds of love for our next class. Focus on, um, yeah, go back to 57.